Yes, I will do so. Record button. Okay, wonderful. So uh, folks uh, who are in the attendee panel world, uh, welcome to the uh, panel discussion, Changing the Landscape of Education. I'm uh, very excited to have uh, a veritable pantheon of biomedical engineering uh, educators uh, with us. Uh, we're going to have, uh, I hope, a very lively uh, discussion. I have uh, posted the two questions that we're going to pose uh, to our panelists to uh, discuss, and then we're going to take about 25 to 30 minutes per question. And when we're done, uh, the uh, portals are all open for uh, questions. You can uh, use either the chat or the Q&A features to uh, type your questions or uh, the raise hand feature, and you can then uh, just uh, be part of the discussion. So the two questions that we had uh, shared with the panel was uh, basically, what do we do now because of the COVID-19 uh, that we should uh, do basically when we get back into the in-person teaching mode? And how can we better address diversity, equity, and inclusion in our overall biomedical engineering curriculum? So we're gonna start with the first uh, question. And, and by the way, uh, uh, I'm one of the monitors, my, uh, colleague, Dr. Zapanta from CMU is a, a other moderator. I'm indebted to all his uh, help and guidance. So Conrad, if you have a few things to say, please do, and then we'll start the discussion. Thanks, Arash. Um, nothing really big to add other than to thank the panelists for this. And clearly one hour is not enough for these discussion topics, but I do think it's a chance to think about something. Um, to address these as a group, but also for those uh, attendees, maybe think about one thing that you can take home from this. So the homework would be to take one thing from this discussion and then implement it uh, at your institution. And with that, I guess we can start. Absolutely. So I really don't have any, uh, whoever wants to start, by all means. I don't want to call any names. Who's the brave soul who wants to? Mike. Sure, just I'll just jump in with one one idea is that um, something that I've I've done a lot of, and I'm sure a lot of folks on this call have done a lot of, is spending time on Zoom. And so some things work actually better on Zoom. Not some things don't work at all on like a video platform, but. Um, one thing that has really kind of impacted the way that I'm on my workflow is office hours. So I do my office hours now um, on Zoom. Now, we, or my university is in person for the most part for our learning. So I, I could meet with students in my office, but practically that doesn't really work for a variety of social distancing reasons. So we just meet on Zoom and um, it actually works pretty well for a lot of the things that I would be troubleshooting with students when we're looking at some software, debugging, um, you know, looking at code. Um, we can share screens, we can go through and kind of find where the issues are. In the past, we might have bounced back emails to each other and tried to articulate it. And there's some learning that occurs in that process, but it's not very efficient. Um, so I found that having office hours in a, in a Zoom setting actually works pretty well. Plus, I can actually meet with students at non traditional times, like in the evening or on weekends that way. And um, I found that sometimes I'll be working with a student and we'll figure out that there's something that I didn't share to the group that I need to share to everyone. And so we'll just we'll record it. And it's like a walkthrough that then gets posted for my students in our learning uh, platform. So I've, I found that's something that I'm going to keep going forward. So I actually asked my students what they liked about learning in Zoom. And they really liked the recorded lecture. And ideally we'd all be in a classroom together, but even in normal times, students miss class for a wide variety of reasons. Um, they're sick, they have a sporting event, they have a job interview, especially with juniors and seniors. And just having those lectures available is a lot easier than trying to get notes from a friend or notes from a professor. But then thinking more broadly, we also have students who go on co-op, they study abroad, maybe they take a semester or even a couple weeks of a semester off to deal with a family situation, or maybe they have some financial issue. So I think now that recorded lectures have become 
normal, I think it will give students a lot more flexibility for a wide variety of reasons. Yeah, I, um, I echo Lori's point there. I mean, I, I was a little hesitant about the video lectures at first, but it, it actually has been quite a benefit. And to, to hopefully kind of complement her point, one of the things that I find myself thinking about more, and it relates to our second question, is with regards to equity. I mean, students have different levels of capacity with regards to their, their vision or their hearing or just how they interpret materials. So having that out front there, it, it places the burden more on us as instructors than the student having to come forward and maybe not wanting to, to disclose some physical or mental shortcoming they might have but by having the videos there, they don't have to worry about it so much. And, and the second thing I, I find has been important during this time is, is less kind of a, a technical aspect, but more just kind of a, a thought process. I mean, I've always been pretty stern and with my class with regards to deadlines and the, the level of, of professionalism I expect in the classroom. And I think overall professionalism is changing just because of what we've been doing in terms of all this online work and learning over the last year. So I've been learning more about, you know, where you can bend and where you can be a lot more flexible and still have quality. I found that the, the flexibility over the last year has not come to the detriment of student learning. So that's something I, I intend to hang on to going forward. I wanna um, piggyback off of what Dr. Kyle was just saying. I had pulled my students, we were posed these questions in advance and I did my own brainstorm, but I also pulled um, just a, a small tech collective of mine. There's just 29 students in the course and. 22 responded, but a few of them um, mentioned this need for compassion and empathy and how that, and I actually want to read a quote from somebody I thought it was really poignant. They wrote, um, I feel as though prior to COVID-19, a college student's struggle was their own problem, and it took a pandemic to truly acknowledge the importance of prioritizing mental health over a deadline. Um, so I, th I think kind of the shift is exactly what Dr. Kyle was saying regarding recognizing where we can afford some flexibility and what is the meaning of deadlines? What's the meaning of attendance? What's um, Maybe it is important in some circumstances, but we need to have reasoning and justification for that. Yeah, I, um, I'm seeing a lot of the same themes. So I also gave my students um, a mid-semester survey. And um, one of the themes, again, was like this availability of having recorded lectures. I'm teaching an in-person lab, actually starts after this panel, but, um, but also a lecture. And so they really enjoyed the recording aspects. Um, but another theme is... Mental health and wellness, uh, I think, has, you know, kind of been flagged for everyone recently. And so um, last semester, I started this new thing where I basically use five minutes or less of class just to emphasize some aspect of wellness. Um, so whether or not it's uh, related to scientific literature that shows, you know, that exercising can help um, you know, make these mental health uh, effects or, or whether or not it's just reminders about, you know, what it is to fail and how do we move forward from failure. And so that was one of the things in the survey that the students found uh, really impactful and um, encouraged me to keep doing. Um, <clears throat> so I think, yeah, this, this kind of being aware of, of mental health be, uh, awareness of, of those deadline flexibilities, um, but also just just kind of that that empathy that sometimes is a little bit difficult um, when we're all on Zoom and we're not actually able to see each other's faces when we're in person. So, all right. So I guess I'm I'm last. Um, plus 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 all of that, right? Um, and, and I think we all know there have been issues in higher ed in so many different dimensions. And, and so I want to talk about an inflection point. And because we're all engine nerds, we actually know what an inflection point actually really is, um, not the way it's used in the media. And it usually is a, there's some near-term changes that then snowball and accelerate to actually cause some long-term change. Um, what I think we've heard are, are a lot of the, the, the near-term things that have happened. But here's something, there was no new tech that was actually invented during COVID. So long-term, I think what this has done is it's changed our mindsets 
And what I mean by that, how we approach teaching, how we think about what education means, how we think about our students, how they think about us, right? All these big questions have actually been tossed up in the air and we've had to find at first Kluge's answers to how we were gonna move forward. But I think, you know, the whole point of this panel is that we then discovered that there were some things that were actually gonna work. And we were able to do that. We're able to have a panel like this because we're beginning to change our mindset. So I'm gonna put on my crazy Joe hat for just a second. So follow me, cause you all are used to me doing this. Um, imagine sometime in the future, your students put on their whatever VR headset, first day of class, they enter into a room, they see a whole bunch of doors to get through them. They have to complete some challenge that you've set for them. Um, to get to the next room. Maybe they get credits, maybe they get a tool, whatever you can imagine, right? But it gives them access to even more. Some of the tasks might be individual, some may be as groups. Um, you get to set what those are and the clues and tasks get harder as they move out, right? And there could be Easter eggs embedded within it that you need to discover, right? I mean, we all know that gamification sort of works and you can superimpose on top of it a murder mystery, an escape room, a slay the drag. I don't care, right? It doesn't matter. And there can be multiple pathways, multiple ways to win. Um, for those of you worried about rigor and all that, um, maybe there's a minimum amount that you need to explore, but there's an infinite ways you could go beyond that. And it's independent of content, right? This could be a computing class. It could be a history class. It could be a music or anthropology class. Um, what do we become? We become the game designers that are filling in the clues. Um, we know what's going to be sticky, right? It's make sticky experiences. So we put that in. If the interface for us to build this is easy enough, Minecraft, right? Haptic gloves, you can like build the room you want. If it's easy enough for us to build, it's easy enough for your students to build. Final projects could become build out more of the world, right? You've explored what I've created, now build out more. So why am I sharing all this? It's pie in the sky. But everything I just said, the tech, already exists to do that. What's the barrier? The barrier to doing it is, is not as much the tech, it's the mindset that we have and the mindset that our administrators have. So again, whether you agree that this is a good approach or not, I'm using it as a provocative example of how I think before COVID, you all would have been frowning and going, no, that'll never work. We couldn't possibly do that. But I think now after COVID, we're like, yeah, we could see that happening. And what does it open up? Up, it opens up so many more possibilities of cross-institution courses, student design courses, right? I mean, you name it, study abroad could change the way they think about things. So again, I, I think as BMEs, we're at the perfect intersection to be leading some of these things because we're educators and we think all the time about the interface between people and tech. Um, so anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Well, I think Dr. Tranquillo brings up a really important point about intentional course design. Um, so regardless of the dissemination mechanism, whether you're doing gamification or not, I think that this pandemic has really shed a light on intentional course design, evaluating what our course goals and objectives are, what activities we're doing, um, making sure that they're aligned and meaningful, and then what our assessments are. Um, I mean, in, in a traditional engineering course, you know, historically it's been very lecture based with some sort of exam in an hour and a half time slot. A lot of that has changed because of the setting we're in. A lot of folks have changed the, an exam format to maybe projects or take home exams where it's more kind of problem based. Um, and students also have uh, appreciated that. They, it el eliminates the stress associated with time. Um, so I, I think really kind of big picture, that's been the most impactful thing, I think, getting people to think really intentionally about their course design. Yeah. I completely, completely agree with that, Sarah. Sorry, sorry Aaron. But yeah, the, um, the, uh, the course design, that we, so we were sort of forced in in many cases to kind of rethink um, the, the design of the course or like how it was going to be deployed. And, and sometimes it was to make it re, you know, re, robust enough to be in-person or online or hybrid. And so in, in many cases, we did a heavy lift this past year to make a course like, okay, I'm going to teach this in person, but for a student who can't be here because they're out or they're being cautious, I'm going to make it this different version. So like I made a lot of tutorials for the things I was going to do in class to say, okay, don't come to class today. It's okay. Do this tutorial. And so that was a very near term pressing need to get that done, but it's just making me think that I should really do that all the time, that I should really have those materials available for someone who 
if, you know, if auditory isn't their primary learning format, that, that now they can go back to that tutorial after class and really soak it in. And, and we'll get into some things with inclusion here in a few minutes too. But I just, I think there's a lot that we can pull from that, that um, if we were intentional about it going forward. Um, the, so like the tutorials that I've done and then like kind of kit design for classes, like here's a kit, you can now take this with you to the lab and use it, or you can do it at home. And now it's much more portable. Um, I'm kind of really thinking about how I can design my courses that way going forward. I, I want to echo that and say, you know, I, I was always a like, students shouldn't be on their phone. They shouldn't be learning, right? Like that's bad, evil, right? You know, and it, and it showed a, a you know, a, maybe a terrible age bias, right? If it's bad, but one of the things I did was to actually, and I've always thought about this, I've been moving towards a paperless class over time. COVID forced me to go completely 100% paperless as a class. And the consequence of that was my entire course in various forms is available on a phone. Um, my syllabus has become a clickable Google syllabus um, that has links to everything. And now the thing that I've been bothered by for so long, which is like, the syllabus has become this thing that you pass out the first day and you talk about it and then it's never looked at again. Well, now it's the central hub, right? Like that's where students go. And because it's on things like Google Docs, they can get to it any time. They can look up an assignment at any time. So it's it's made resources and some it's forced me to make my resources in the places where they actually look and in their normal path of what they're using all the time, which for a lot of students is, is their phone. Actually, before we shift to Sean G, Aaron, you, I know that uh, we cut you off there. We apologize. Okay. No, I, I was going to say I, I'm a lot with Sarah about the, the re-examination of courses. I think all of us, for example, we at Columbia, we, we were mostly online this year. And I, I suspect all of us kind of saw these kind of best practices for creating online courses. And where it starts is not just assuming your materials readily port over to an online fashion that you have to go and really scrutinize what you're doing. And while that should kind of be intrinsic to what we do anyway, uh, oftentimes you get busy or some things work, so why change them? And this really forced at least me to, to take a step back and look at it as, okay, what are we doing? Why are we doing it this way? How does it feed into the objectives of the course? How does it map to see like ABET outcomes? And then how to really de-risk things, for example, like, uh, like Joe and Mike were talking about with regards to having kits and things like that. How do you how do you troubleshoot things when you're not going to be in the room with people to, to help fix it up? So I, I definitely appreciate that opportunity to take a step, uh, a forced step back and really take a look at what was going on here and use that to, to better inform what's, what's going on in terms of the course content, making refinements, and also thinking about what to do going forward here, right? When we are back in person, what are some of these best practices that will carry over? I can say one thing for myself, I like Rachel also teach a, a laboratory course and it's been all online. And one of the things that has kind of bubbled up in years past, but never really, at least with me, gained a lot of traction was, you know, doing video demos of everything. And now I, I have video demos of all my lab procedures, having exemplary data sets so that, I mean, I, I, I am fully an embracer of the students being in the lab and stuff going wrong. And if they get a crummy data set, that's fine. You, you figure out why it went wrong and you can report on that. You're not going to get penalized because it's wrong. But at least now that frustration can be ameliorated a bit by the fact that they do have an ideal set of data that they can work from and really focus on the concepts in coordination with the, the kind of troubleshooting and the frustrations of when things go wrong. Thank you. And actually, let's go ahead and shift, if you don't mind, quickly to... Uh... Sanjeev, you've been patient. Do you have a question? <laughs> Good morning. No, this 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 is a wonderful discussion that I'm really enjoying it. You know, uh, I think I I what Sarah and Aaron said absolutely resonates with me. I think the for me the biggest thing was uh, uh, an explicit realization that there is no one monolithic pathway to success in teaching. Everybody has to carve their own way. That's the key thing in that. Uh, this this sort of an experiment or a perturbation that nature threw at us uh, at least made me think about uh, about these things what works you know and and because it was a situation where i was as anxious as anybody else as to what am i going to do and 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 that 
that sort of forced me to think about things that I normally would not have thought because it was almost had become a routine stuff in a, how I do my business. And I think that's the biggest advantage. So I, I look at this COVID experience as an, a perturbation that forced me to sort of reflect back on how, uh, figuring out. And I realized uh, something about on my personal thing that I, I how much of uh, energy I derive by one-on-one -on -one personal interactions you know in the classroom uh, that sort of is missing but that's that's many of us probably did that realization but what i'm trying to say is that that the act of self internal reflections and trying to figure out and realizing that really you have to figure out your own way you know just don't take for grant, you know, you can take best practices and stuff, but you have to figure out, and there are many ways to success. It's not always the same thing. And, and, and just those realizations will make things better. Thank you for that. And actually one thing I did want to throw in, since I think I'm required to say at least one thing, um, is I think back to intentional course design, you realize what's important and what's really not that important. So I definitely think that some course objectives will be trimmed back a bit when we get, because, you know, it's um, back to, you know, mental health of students and also mental health of the faculty. So one thing I was thinking too, when Mike was talking about office hours and doing them the evening, you know, shifting them to the evening was a bit of, was definitely a bit of a lift, I think. And that was um, having to balance when to have office hours versus when should I have office hours for, was I think was something to think about, but um, definitely intentional course design, I think, is one thing that we do. And I am proud of the fact that we have now two engineering terms. We've used inflection point and we've used perturbation. So now we need to work, someone needs to work in transfer function in the next few minutes. And perhaps George, with his question, can do that. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not sure. I'll try. Uh, Thank you, George. Can you hear me okay? We yes. can hear you, George. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so my course that I taught this semester... Uh, was the instrumentation course. And I actually put together kits for everybody using uh, the Scopy, which is this stuff that comes from analog devices. Everybody has a little plug-in that turns their computer into an oscilloscope and a power supply and, and all that stuff. And I sent little kits of resistors and stuff. It was a real pain in the, in the neck. Uh, but but um, it's working out okay. But I guess my message, I don't know about transfer functions, but uh, it, it was an experiment. And we had to be flexible. People actually, it's harder to debug a circuit on your own uh, by holding it up to the camera with the TAs looking at them uh, than you think. And I've uh, and the course has evolved. Uh, you know, become I, I, I'm using the last few lectures to just help people with their labs, and I'm pre-recording now. You know, but I started using live lectures, and and so the whole thing was an experiment using feedback. So it's a transfer function, but it has feedback in it. Uh, and um, like you said, everybody has a different um, response and, and, and you got to be flexible as a whole. The course definitely didn't end up where it started, but I think it's working. Uh, and, and you shift your goals, uh, you know, to what's actually practical. Uh, and, um, and I guess that's all I have to say. Yeah. George, thank you for using transfer functions. So Hello? perhaps my, my lesson learned there is that everyone is its own is, is their own transfer function. We we have different inputs and we go to different outputs. And Joe, I'm just thanking you earlier for not making me dance during your little talk. So <laughs> you you joke, Conrad, but I have I I actually have had my students do movement exercises on Zoom. Um, okay, and it was it was great, right? I mean, it, it was really. <laughs> welcome and they were getting up and I think that's another piece that I think we've all learned is the you know the like we're all going to leave this meeting because it's going to end on time and then there's going to be a next one right after there and the importance of those in-between spaces um, and, and I know lots of instructors have created those um, in their within their class at the beginning of class at the end of class um, you know, again, for those of you who have read the book Small Teaching or the, the follow-up to that um, kind of Small Teaching Online, um, great books. And the entire theme of both of those books is there are small things that you can do in your class that really matter. They're not hard to do. You can pick them up and start using them like tomorrow. 
Um, and, and I think a lot of those were ignored for a long time. And I watched, so just in the interest of full disclosure, I'm the director of our teaching and learning center. Um, so this makes me really, really happy because I led, I don't even want to tell you how many workshops this past summer, um, trying to convince faculty to change their classes. And that was not an easy lift, but became easier over time. And that idea of small teaching was really impactful because I think folks realized that, yeah, there are these small things that I can do that will, that will make my class more inclusive, more equitable, more interesting, um, more sticky, um, all of those other bits and pieces. And, and that it doesn't need to be a, what I had said earlier, totally change your class, gamify it, flip it, do whatever, right? Um, that there were some really simple things. And, and I think many of the things that have been mentioned already are those simple things that we're going to keep. Wonderful. And uh, Sarah kindly uh, posted the small teaching by James Lang in the chat. Uh, one thing we uh, wanted to do was to also, uh, I think George and uh, Sanjeev took advantage to the other attendees. You're more than welcome to ask any questions uh, as we were having this uh, discussion before we transition to the second uh, questions. So if there are any, please feel free to either use the chat or the Q&A or the raise hand feature to be part of this magnificent discussion. And I would say if there are any students in the audience, uh, perhaps is there anything that you are changing? Would be interesting. Wonderful well. question. Well, I see some of our students, but I'm not going to name names. I was going to name some too. I can see one. No, no, I'm going to. <laughs> we do. could do this, but no, it would be wrong. <laughs> your, your grade depends on this. And then all of a sudden. <laughs> if anyone wants extra credit, we're going to write your name down right now. <laughs> so one, it's a very uh, perhaps uh, naive question, but with all the different technology that is out there. So one, uh, perhaps a uh, procedure we were trying to follow was to minimize all of these uh, tools uh, for minimizing um, confusion uh, from uh, the student side. So, you know, because there are all these, you know, you have Canvas, you have, I don't know, Blackboard, you have uh, Piazza or all those things. Should we worry about that from, let's say within each institution and all the different things, or you think that it's not, a necessary thing to worry and students can adapt to these different platforms. So I can start, I feel as though the students are very adaptable, probably more so or much more so than the faculty. I think where students struggle is when faculty put their different, their information in different places. Um, we all use Zoom, we all use course site at Lehigh and that's those are the normal platforms that students have become used to. So I think when some faculty don't use those standard mechanisms, that's where students get a little bit confused. So I, I think if we're consistent across the institution, that seems to work. Yeah, I would just add that there um, people are certainly adaptable, but there is a lot of mental energy that goes into trying to navigate finding information. Um, and I think especially for new students, so transfer students or first year students that aren't already acclimated to those sites, trying to have consistency both in where you're posting materials, but also within um, how, so we use Canvas at our institution and, you know, you could use Canvas to as basically just a, a file repository, you could use it and set up modules. There's a lot of different ways to use these different learning management systems and the more consistency that we can have within our course and also between courses, I think it, it offloads the burden from people. Absolutely. I think one of the challenges that uh, it's, as you said, uh, not the adaptability, but the constant uh, messaging as well, announcements and all the different uh, emails that are going in. Um, I think one also needs to be cognizant of that one and minimize to the extent possible uh, to not bombard. I definitely know a lot more faculty that, that switch to some form of messaging system, um, whether that was as simple as GroupMe or Slack or Trello or whatever, right? Um, there were some faculty that actually made one of those project management tools 
um, the center of their course, right? There was no Moodle site or Canvas site or Google Doc or whatever. It was all up on, say, Slack. Um, and they had, they had success with that. And I think that's, again, another tool that's been around for a long time. It's used in industry. It was used sparingly by a handful of faculty. And, and I, I watched more and more and more adopt some version of that to cut through the noise of email. Absolutely. George? Okay, uh, so I think I agree with everything you're saying, but what actually happened in one of my courses, I taught a music course, electronic music. Uh, the students uh, formed their own uh, Discord site where you could go 24 hours a day and talk, and they invited me to it, and I'm the one who was an old curmudgeon and didn't, couldn't really tolerate yet another platform that I had to learn, and I didn't go there, and I probably should have and hung out with them, you know, in their environment. Uh, but, you know, I have a limited bandwidth. Uh, so, so it, it kind of goes both ways, actually, when the students set up their own environments, which I don't think is bad at all. No. Um, Not at all. I agree. Well, if there's no question from uh, the attendees, perhaps we're at uh, 9.01, uh, we can slowly move to the second question and then also leave some time for a Q&A over there. So the second question to the panel is, how can we better address diversity, equity, and inclusion in our BME curriculum? Anyone who wishes to jump in? Sure, I I'll get started on this and I think, um, I I think like many of us, uh, we've spoken on these topics uh, quite a few times, especially over the last year in light of all the, the societal upheaval. And anybody that's seen me probably knows the, the, thing that, that, the things that pop up in my mind. But one of the things that I, I really find myself thinking about a lot lately is the, the intentionality of inclusion of DEI into what we do as, as BME educators. So, I mean, I, I'll speak from my own experiences and my methods. For the longest time, probably for the, the first seven or eight years of my career, what I was doing with regards to, to diversity considerations was, was pretty implicit, or it was tangential to what might happen on a senior design project. For example, we might go through a project and think about things in kind of a, a standard and very methodological way, and then at the end kind of see, I was like, oh, this would affect some segment of the population differently than everybody else, but it wouldn't be an initial consideration, it wouldn't be an initial design input. And what we would find is that we would get to that point and then the solution wouldn't be well tailored to that specific portion of the population that would probably have been well served by thinking about it from the very beginning. And part of that was a bit of inexperience on my part, but also a, a bit of trepidation about including or, or trying to mandate considerations of these issues within the framework of my courses, especially coming from the perspective of being a minority myself I didn't want to seem like I was trying to kind of bludgeon people with my own initiatives and, and thoughts on these sorts of things. But what I find increasingly is A, the, the, the substantial benefits that come with specific inclusion of these issues kind of early on in projects and in instruction. That is a, my point with regards to design projects is specificity, right? The more specific the problem is, the better you're going to do with regards to the solution. And part of specificity is saying explicitly is like, look, there's this problem that, that might affect the broader population in this way, but because of societal factors and, and certain other things, it's going to affect a, a certain segment of the population another way, and it's fine for us to pursue that pathway. So it allows for a more explicit pursuit of the projects, and that's something that I think can be shown definitively within the, the span of a course. The other part of it is more kind of, it is a bit softer. I mean, if we have these expectations that diversity issues are truly going to be appreciated going forward, then that starts with the, the people that we are educating, developing this appreciation early in their pathway. Why could you expect someone that was 10, 15, 20 years into their careers to start doing this sort of thing if they, they had never, it had never been instilled in them early on how important this is, that it is comparable to the technical skills that they might be obtaining during their training. So I think those two things combined together at least have led me to be more intentional in these sorts of efforts and making it a part of what, we're, what we do as BME educators. Yeah, I absolutely agree with what Dr. Kyle was just saying. From my perspective, I kind of see it break down into three different realms. 
I see um, inclusive pedagogy. So how are instructional techniques, what, what our instructional techniques are. I also see, as Dr. Kai was talking about, basically this deliberate instruction of content-wise of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion embedded within our BME coursework. Um, and then I also see policy kind of structural changes that might take place outside of the classroom. So those are things like um, funding for scholarships or student organizations that are affinity groups, having appropriate academic and social support for different subpopulations of students, hiring in so that you have faculty and staff role models. Um, but to focus more on this deliberate instruction piece that Dr. Kyle was just talking about, I see that kind of breaking down further into three main areas, um, discussion of inequities within research and medicine, discussion of medical device design um, and designing for different uh, populations and what our biases are and how those impact those designs. And then also deliberate instruction in teamwork. Um, since people are students and once they graduate need to be able to work on diverse teams. I'll, I'll go back to the inflection point thing again, just because I think it's it's another great example of, um, and you know we're we're using DEI right um, at as kind of a framework. And to be perfectly honest with you, the universities I've been in touch with seem to go through this evolutionary process of they look at the numbers and they focus on diversity and they think you know oh well we're going to make this number better, um, but it's not actually making anything more equitable or inclusive. It's just increasing the diversity number. Um, and then there's an evolutionary process that you hope happens where it goes into inclusion and equity. Um, the issue is it ends up becoming, a, a, or it was, a, a group of folks who were the champions, um, who were doing what they could do, and, and where I think the inflection point has come. And part of it's due to COVID, part of it is due to social unrest. I mean, there's lots of different factors, you know, we, I, I think, but we've had this reckoning where I think you're exactly right, Dr. Kyle and Dr. Rooney, that um, it, it has, I think, accelerated bringing this down to actionable things at our universities that are now not just we're going to talk about changing the policy or talk about where does inclusion come in a classroom or talking about where is the module in a design course that specifically addresses um, human-centered design, universal design, universal design for learning, right? You know, where, where does, when, when are we going to have the headspace and actually make that a priority? And I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're getting there. And I, I think the wonderful, hopeful part of me is that individuals are beginning to explore it on their own. They're not being told to do it. They're actually seeing that it's valuable and they're trying things in their class. And, you know, I, I know we put the, the small teaching thing in, right? But there are some small things that you can do that make a big difference. And I think I've watched over time, at least the faculty here and some others at other institutions, try small things that they then realize make a difference and it catalyzes their desire to try more. Um, right to say, wow, that was really cool. That actually worked. This stuff really does make a difference in my class. And it's, it's a kinder place for me. It's a kinder place for my students. Um, I can add on one thing that we've tried out uh, maybe two years ago now. I worked with a faculty group. I also co-chair our college's undergraduate diversity working group. Um, and so I worked with a faculty group to develop uh, mini modules on inclusive teaching practices. So this is focused on what instructors can do in the classroom. So it's not focused on um, changing the students in any way. It's trying to make our classrooms more inclusive. So we, our approach was to make these 10 minute mini modules that then we disseminated via departmental faculty meetings. So we have uh, seven departments in our college and we ended up with six mini modules. So that meant over the course of the year, we essentially made 42 presentations. Um, but these were actually really well received. And I think it comes back to what Dr. Tranquillo was saying is that they were small um, evidence-based shifts that we can make in the classroom. And I think the fact that it was this year long series rather than a single one-time workshop where you kind of, you go in for an hour and you leave and forget about it. 
it led to ongoing discussions. And it's those small ongoing discussions that I think eventually catalyze change. Right, so that goes to show it really needs to be a deliberate effort. So as my colleagues have mentioned, we can build up diversity, but we also have to look at the equity and inclusion. And when people arrive on campus, it's not just enough that they're there. We actually need to create that correct environment. And I think a number of faculty just need a little bit of direction. And I think those modules and teaching experiences are really a wonderful idea. I've got other thoughts, but I know, I'm sorry, Rachel, please go ahead. I didn't want to monopolize anything. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Tranquilo, Kyle and Rooney, you, you all kind of hit on some of the topics that I've been thinking about, but one thing that um, hasn't been brought up yet is these kind of um, research opportunities, internships, projects that students do. I think that is a good area to um, help in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when I was an undergraduate student, I had to work in order to pay my rent. Um, and I was only applying to research projects that were going to pay me. Um, <laughs> so the, I think um, being willing to pay undergraduate students and pay them well is, uh, is a good opportunity to help with students who are maybe coming from, um, you know, disadvantaged socioeconomic areas, right? And uh, also there's, you know, the national push to increase minimum wage to $15 an hour. And I'm looking at how much, um, I've been at two institutions recently, they're paying undergraduates the same amount, like base amount. And it's the same amount as when I was an undergraduate over 10 years ago. So <laughs> um, I think uh, if, if you can pay your, pay your undergraduate students, uh, these, I mean, it is an educational opportunity, but they're also doing work. So um, that would be just one potential area that we haven't really discussed yet. I would, um, so the thing that, that I advocate hugely for as well, and this speaks to the diversification side of things is the importance of outreach, right? The importance of extending our educational mission beyond the, the boundaries of our campuses, especially for those of us whose campuses might be buttressed with communities that are underserved, more specifically underserved in STEM and even more specifically in engineering. And then if we go down to the next level in biomedical engineering, right? I, I think it's, um, I think we do a disservice by making these arguments for diversification of our field, be it at the, the student or the faculty levels, if we don't cultivate the, the guards that are going to give rise to the, the, the students that are going to come along later. And that is kind of sharing what we know as educators and as engineers with local teachers, bringing students onto our campus, right? Not just the, the 4.0 student from some great institution for an REU, but maybe the kid at a high school and local community that maybe the school isn't so great and this person isn't going to have that experience. So I, I, I think the, the, the thoughts behind outreach are changing a little bit, that it is something that's not just being thought of as an altruistic endeavor, but can actually serve most institutions. There are certainly opportunities to do research related to this. I mean, my own research has become outreach education and, and STEM and local communities and things like that. So I think kind of doing that sort of thing, showing it's a, it's a viable pathway with regards to your careers. Like Rachel was saying, I mean, if you're gonna have students working in the community, paying them for it, right? Not just saying, oh, do this because it'll look good on your, your CV and because it's a nice thing to do, but you know, give them, put some money in their pocket, show them that this is part of the, the training that goes into being a, a well-rounded biomedical engineer. I think all of these things falling under the umbrella of outreach are an important part of any sort of DEI argument. Mike, you've been nodding your head a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just did it every. So many great tips here and and thoughts. Yeah, you know, on this very specific pieces of inclusion in the classroom, I, something I've been trying to do more of is I, I I talk. So I'm glad you pointed out, Connor, that I was quiet there. I I talk too much. I think in my 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 teaching, it's it's too much of me talking, and I'm trying to 
be a better listener. I'm trying to practice active listening in my in my classes. And I, I just I think I've learned a lot this past year about all the assumptions that I think are inherent in some of the things that we do in higher ed and how those are really laid bare when sort of the equalizers that we thought were in place were taken away during a pandemic and suddenly the access to things that we assumed everyone had, actually they didn't have when they when they went back to their own um, their own workflows. And so I'm trying to do a better job of, of active listening uh, in the classroom. I do think we have an opportunity in a very specific way in biomedical engineering to connect with now a really wide percentage of our population using the pandemic as a touchstone. Now, so, so like if, you know, one of the things that in the past when we've gone to talk with different groups of people is how do you connect with what we're doing in biomedical engineering to everyone's backgrounds? Um, and I think we, we could have done a better job of that before. And I think we just have a really good opportunity now to say, look, this is crazy. We've all gone through this experience together. But here's how biomedical engineers are playing a role in this process from the diagnosis, screening, to, to treatment, the epidemiology. And it's now a touchstone that I think we can connect with a really wide range of people about and, and talk about our field. And I think that, that that's an opportunity that we, we can you know, bring more people into the fold with. Absolutely. And we have a, a comment from one of our uh, attendees uh, that uh, reads, thank you for having this discussion. I wanted to validate that, yes, indeed, recorded lectures have been great. Panopto is my favorite because you can navigate the audio by clicking on the slides. We found that 70 people live streaming for attendance purposes did not work. Streaming issues, internet slows to a crawl. You couldn't understand what was being said but you had to sit there anyway in front of the camera. What did work was recorded lectures followed by small groups. Again, I think going to the theme of uh, small is magnificent. People discussion uh, assigned 15 or 30 minute slots from which attendance was taken. So I think echoes what we were also discussing in general. I just wanted to share that from one of the attendees. So one thing I've been kind of, kind of taking some notes here, and Mike, as you said, I love to hear myself talk, so this is my problem. Um, from an, you know, I have to break out the A bit words. So you know, the um, we have new criteria to work with, and I specifically think of outcomes two and outcomes four. You know, society. All, it's for those you're not familiar. It's the one with all the commas. I like to call it, but I do think that is an opportunity there for to address diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout those two outcomes. So actually, part of my work this summer and I'll be contacting you guys to come up best practices for that um, because, you know, it is for better or worse, sometimes, you know, we made a lot of comments, uh, comments here about being intentional and deliberate. Having an external body do that for you is not the worst thing in the world either. And as a side note too, I would not be surprised if ABED actually, I won't say requires DEI, but it's definitely going to have encouraging people to include that as part of the ABET criteria. Again, not being paid by ABET, you know, it's literally, you know, my ABET hat, which I literally have the next drawer over. It would be awkward to put it on right now, but um, slight plug, everyone should be an ABET evaluator. Make sure that shows up in the article. Um, the, um, I think it's, again, back to the thing about being intentional and deliberate. Basically, the, maybe the lesson is, if we don't do it ourselves, someone may tell it to do us for it. Someone may tell us to do it for so as well. Um, questions from the audience. I know that we've been chatting a lot here. We did oh, have Sanjeev. Uh, oh, Sanjeev, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, so this is this is sort of my own education. I've been thinking about this issue, particularly uh, because uh, I'm also a chair of the department and uh, in that perspective. So so the two questions I wanted to ask and want to hear the views from the panel. Uh, the first one is, this, this is my interpretation, I may be completely in the left field. I sometimes feel that uh, faculty, particularly young faculty, are a bit overwhelmed uh, by the semantics, the language, the the things to, you know put out there in the context of DEI and, and, and they're a little bit overwhelmed as to what they need to be doing, you know. Uh, so what I was wondering is, uh, would it be better that this discussion is presented in a in a very basic form, distilled into very simple human qualities, such as respect, empathy, 
and in a uh, ability to listen those kinds of things as opposed to other quote unquote fancy words you know and that's my first thing and the second thing was uh, do you guys think all faculty must do something in this area and this should become part of their evaluation uh, you, you know, uh, so so uh, so these are the two things, and you can see the administrator's role coming in here. You know, so I'd love to hear the thoughts, uh, you guys, so, because you 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 have thought about this much more than I have. I I will jump in on both. Um, so one thing I don't know if this exactly addresses it, um, but one of the things that I posted is something that our teaching and learning center. So this was me, um, created in July. Um, and we used it in some workshops and things that we did. And, and you're exactly right. It was a, we can't tell faculty, you need to do this, right? Um, it would be nice. It would be wonderful to say, this is the best practice. You should be doing these things. So where we defaulted was to say, you know, look at your course through these four simple lenses. Um, and if you're looking at the file, they were, what can your students see? What can your students hear? What can they do actively and how are they connecting with you and others in there? And then below each of those frameworks, there's kind of a little rationale. And then there's kind of things that you can do, right? Concrete things you could actually try in your class. So you all are free to you know, steal whatever from that, um, but you're exactly right. I work with a lot of new faculty and, and telling them like, think about your content, think about your learning objectives, think about this, think about that. Oh, and by the way, right? And I think that's the problem is, is the by the way, and it becomes as, as Dr. Kyle pointed out, it becomes an afterthought. It's an add-on, right? And so I, I think getting it in there early as a design criteria as you're making your class is critical. Um, but you're right, you need to follow up. In terms of the institutional side of things, I, I can say that my department has actually changed our department review document. We tried it two years ago. Um, we tried adding elements of DEI throughout our document and it was rejected at a university level because we were told that it was there was the appearance that we were adding a fourth category of review and that that was in and of itself not equitable right across the university that if only our department had this as a requirement that it then puts our department actually and our candidates at a disadvantage in comparison to someone who's in chemical or mechanical or some other discipline. That's changed. Um, we resubmitted it and our university now said, not only are we going to accept your document, but this will be put into the university level document. It's now going to be a requirement of, of all. So in, we're not quite there yet, but our university is very close to having a, a fourth um, criteria that can be woven into any of the other three categories. So you can, you can study it as a scholarly discipline. Um, if that's your scholarship, you can do, use it as part of your service or it could become something that's embedded in your teaching. And the argument that won the day on my campus, and I can't promise that it'll win the day on yours, was, I don't know, five years ago, we started requiring faculty to turn in when they, when they apply for a position, a teaching statement, a research statement, and a DEI statement. The argument that won the day was if we're asking for those three statements, why are we only asking in the review procedures to see growth in only two of them? Why do we only want to see growth in two? Why are, if this is important enough to ask at the interview, why is it not important enough to evaluate their growth as they're going through review processes? So again, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, uh, but you sparked a bunch of ideas. Yeah, I actually, I have thoughts on, on both of those questions as well. And I'll actually start with the, the second question. And I, I think we're all of a similar mind. I'm almost of a similar mind as Joe. But you mentioned the thing about it, it being a part of evaluation. And the short answer is yes. Yes, it should be a part of evaluation. However, I look at it, I, I like to think more about things as, as having the carrot, not the stick. So I, I look at it from the standpoint of, hey, this is something that you do, you can do that's just not on top of your regular, say, faculty responsibilities or responsibilities as a student, but something that can be truly appreciated and rewarded or po and possibly even sub being a substitute for certain activities, right? The, the, the classic anecdote we hear, especially about minority faculty, is that 
early in, in our careers, right? You have so many of these other obligations with regards to advising or committee service or, or whatever the case may be to be representative of, of where you come from in addition to accelerating your research program. And that can come to the detriment of some of the research. But what if there are opportunities for some degree of substitution? I'm not suggesting we completely knock down the, the process of scholarship or, or devalue scholarship, but at least have a greater appreciation for what one might be doing that, that supports missions with regards to DEI. Right? Why not have that be something explicitly and say like annual faculty review and say, like, like Joe was saying, right? You're showing growth, not just what your vision is for coming in, but actually showing some achievement with regards to this as you are progressing through your career. So yes, definitely a part of evaluation. With regards to your first question about kind of, if I was interpreting correctly, you're, you were mentioning the notion of teaching these sorts of things and not overwhelming people with jargon. I, I think there's certainly opportunity for that. I think most people are coming from a place of, of empathy. I think there are deficits with regards to understanding how to do these sorts of things, what are best practices. And so I, I think an approach to that is kind of twofold. The first thing is that I think it's important for we specifically as biomedical engineers to define more explicitly what these things mean for us in our discipline, right? Sarah was pointing out, say, like with regards to medical devices, and we've talked about design inputs amongst the few of us here. So it, it can't just be kind of the generalized DEI that, say, my, my wife would receive working at a bank. But what we, what we do specifically for engineering and, and what this means, and then couple that with what I would argue should be regular training or instruction for this. Every year, at least for me, I go through, you know, sexual harassment training. And, and because I work with children, I do protection of minors training every year. Why aren't we doing something that's, that's related to, to DEI on a regular basis? If, if a new faculty comes in, having this sort of stuff, and like Joe is talking about, right, giving them guidance on how you can purposefully make this a part of your research or your instruction people that are already there every year, every couple of years, kind of revisiting these concepts and actually using them going forward. I mean, I, I think we really have a lot of opportunity here, right? It doesn't have to be something that's burdensome. We can, we can and like Conrad was saying, do it the way we think is best instead of having it forced upon us by somebody else. Yeah, I, lo I love that, Aaron. I, I think a lot of the best uh, experiences that I've had in improving anything about my professional career have come from those professional development sort of workshops or opportunities where my teaching improved substantially by this very subtle change that I would do when I learned in one of those workshops. And similarly here, I think a lot of folks would like to be doing more in this space and they just need a little bit of role modeling. And so we can, we can provide that. We have a question. Uh, anyone else would like to tackle the questions by Dr. Shroff? So we have a, I, go ahead. Just, just to, I, I would say just like as a, as a caveat, are there any BME DEI workshops or is there a need for one? And I'm not proposing that I am the right person to do it. Um, maybe some other folks on here are, I'd be happy to help out, but I, I'm, is anyone aware of something specifically as both, you know, Dr. Russ, Dr. Kyle, I think are suggesting I think something like that might be coming. I mean, uh, there's, we're certain, I, I'm working with the, the Council of Diversity Chairs with BMES, and I, I suspect that, I, I don't know for sure, nothing has been set in stone, but I suspect something like that might come up eventually. And I do think here, as long as we're not, so I think we can per perfectly volunteer people who aren't on this panel right now for this, but we do have representatives here from the Biomedical Engineering Society. Thank you, Aaron, for pointing that out, but also ASWE, the American Society of Engineering Education as well, who can both be leaders. And I do know uh, besides uh, Sanjeev, there are some other chairs lurking in the attendees. I know who you are. You know, the Council of Chairs can also drive this as well too, so. Definitely for the upcoming summit, absolutely. Yeah. I think as Aaron mentioned, he's absolutely right. There's, there's going to be a set of workshops going to be implemented through Council of Chairs. He's absolutely right. Wonderful, fantastic. So there's a question to the panel. Uh, do you have advice on how to balance the role of proudly sharing your own diversity as we promote DEI while maintaining professionalism and not crossing the boundary of becoming, in quotations, too personal. Should I tackle this one or does anyone else want to thought? I, I feel like I'm dominating the conversation. Like Mike said, I, I, I like to listen rather than be talking all the time. 
Go I'll ahead. Just, Go I'll, ahead. I'll just say very briefly um, is that I just think it's all about empathy in, in, in a lot of different ways. And, and what I've learned this past year is just to be empathetic with the students and to understand where they're coming from. And I'm trying to be transparent with my students about where I come from and all things to say, like, look, look how here's how my life got turned upside down by this pandemic. Not so that you um, have sympathy, but that you have empathy for what I'm going through. And that way I can can communicate that and then I can better listen uh, to you. But that's just a, a small way. That's, I want to hear what Aaron has to say. Yeah, that's that's a great one. I, I like that. Um, I think it's um, I think this like many of these issues we're talking about is very multifaceted. I mean, one thing I, I found interesting over the years is that uh, I think the students do appreciate some of your personal experience. I think students long for the connection with us that we're not just these entities that are supposed to be passing their knowledge, but we actually are people and we have these experiences and especially I know for myself, especially being, again, minority faculty and having had minority students, I think it does resonate with them to, to see what goes on here. And I, I think this is tricky. I mean, I, I've certainly wrestled with this throughout my own career. Like I mentioned earlier, I was a bit hesitant to do it earlier on, not quite as much now. And maybe that's just becoming kind of a cross of the old man. But um, I, I think there is certainly opportunity to, to be intentional with sharing one's experiences and, and kind of one's perspectives. And there are two things that, that I kind of, or actually one thing that I really emphasize here is that with regards to some of these issues, there's a, there's a difference between kind of presentation of information and evidence and data versus having prejudice and stereotypes. And I think those are the sorts of things that we have to be careful in terms of navigating, right? Like for example, if we talk about these horrible numbers with regards to maternal mortality amongst black women. You can present that data objectively and start to look at the, the various factors that contributed to it without getting into odd and potentially offensive presidential, presidential information or, 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 or viewpoints there. And that's the sort of thing that can, can motivate pursuit of solutions to these problems is focusing on the explicit side of things, but also be cognizant of the, of the fact that it's affecting one portion of the population. Speaking to what I was mentioning earlier, I mean, I, I do think there is appreciation for these sorts of things. I'll give an example from one of my own classes here and I'll try to make it quick. But we were talking about, we were talking last year about kind of the regulatory process and, and vaccine hesitancy. And what ended up being an incorrect hypothesis that, that black people were gonna be particularly hesitant about taking vaccines, right? And that's proven actually not to be true, which is great. But when I brought that up in class, I figured, oh, my students probably know why this is. But one of my students, I was glad he said, he's like, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think black folks are, are hesitant about these sorts of things? And I, I, I was asking, do you mean from my perspective as a black man or just kind of generally? And he said, both. So once he opened the door and, and kind of made it welcome to have that discussion, then it led to a broader discussion. And we started talking about things like, you know, medical experimentation that took place during slavery the Tuskegee experiments, all these issues that redound to, to sort of issues that you see with, within my community to this day that, that lead to these sorts of problems. And I, I feel like it led to a nice kind of full discussion that was decoupled of, of the discomforts that might come with kind of bias, prejudice, stereotypes, but actually looking at, all right, this is where this comes from, right? There's a root to this. There's data that informs what's going on here. And that's the sort of thing that, that we can do, that we can share these sorts of bits of information or things that are important without making it uncomfortable, without kind of trying to propel our own personal agendas, but instead really focusing on, on where the deficits might come from. Yeah. I would add to that that, okay. Um, oh, uh, okay. I would add that authenticity tends to um, help develop the strongest relationships. And there's plenty of literature uh, supporting that basically the number one predictor of student success in college is their interactions with faculty and their interactions with peers. So the more that we can help foster those authentic relationships, student-faculty relationships and student-student relationships, I think it will help them succeed as well. It does kind of come into play. It can be a challenge because people come in with their own biases, implicit biases, 
especially like for me, for example, I was very aware when I first started my career that I was a young woman in engineering. And I have no idea what people actually thought of me, but I was very self-aware that people could have the perception that I am less competent because I'm a young woman in engineering. Um, because of that, I felt the need to act and dress and talk in a particular way. A lot of that, I think, has subsided some um, now that I have more confidence and more experience in my role. And I think that is kind of what Dr. Kyle was saying previously as well. But I think trying to be authentic as much as you can comfortably be authentic in the long term will help students. I was going to go in almost exactly the same direction. And, and in the interest of the idea of small teaching, I can, I can share something that I do the very first day of pretty much every class that I, that I teach. Um, and it's a word that hasn't come up yet. Um, intersectionality, right? I mean, you all can go look at Crenshaw's stuff about intersectionality and, and all of that. Um, but I explicitly talk about how this is what you see on the surface, right? Bald, old, straight, white, male, right? Like that, that's what, what gets projected out. And I think it speaks to, to Sarah's point, right? We all do that. We all project out, out what folks think about us. Overweight, right? Has a lit, whatever, right? It doesn't matter. Those are all parts of who you are. I'm going to share as much as I'm comfortable this first day, a little bit about who I am. And then there's a variety of little exercises that I have them do. They're like, I want to know who you are because to be a good BME, you have to be a human being first. We're here to help other people. And if you don't know yourself how to actually be the person that you are with all your flaws, with all of the things you project outward and have going on inward, it's going to be really hard for you to, as, as a number of folks have brought up, have any sort of sympathy or empathy for the people that you're designing for. And so we're going to talk about that during this class. And, and what I've found is that putting a little bit of vulnerability out there about myself opens students up to feel free to, to open up as well. Um, and again, it's progressive, right? So it's the first day of class. I don't ask them to share it with everyone. It's a share with me as much as you're willing to share with me in a Google Doc or some private way, right? And then I follow up with them. And then there's another exercise that might be in smaller groups, right? Of sharing something a little more personal. And so by the end of the class, and I can't promise it's everyone, um, we can have that kind of conversation that, that um, Dr. Kyle talked about, the either one-on-one -on -one or in groups or with the whole class. And so I, I think our students want to go there. They want to talk about this. It, it's, again, it's our own barrier and our own mindset that I think prevents us from, from actually going there. And we're trained as engineering educators, right? No, it's about the content. Um, <laughs> It doesn't have to be. I, I don't, I think, again, this is the inflection point again. I think we're in an era where we're going to begin as a field to be able to say, we can talk about these things in class. And in fact, it's actually our responsibility to talk about them in our classes. Lori and Rachel, do you guys want to add? Oh, Lori, go ahead. And I think part of it is in fact generational. So the faculty tend to be middle-aged and older, maybe if they're starting their careers, they're a little bit younger. And I think it's generational where we've been trained where you don't talk too much about yourself or reveal too much. And we're the sage on the stage and you have this distance between us and the students. But I think the current generation of college students, I mean, I, part of it is just when you're younger, you reveal more about yourself. But I, I think with social media and all of the other influences, college students now are willing to share more about themselves, perhaps more than we'd like, but I think it's okay. So if we reveal a little bit about ourselves and have that human connection, I think it, it can benefit both sides. I think I want to just add to what uh, Joe was saying. Uh, there's uh, to all your points, I think it's the culture code uh, that one creates in the classroom. And I think it's uh, another term recently I came across, a belonging cue. So we're just basically making that uh, connection within class. So I echo what you're uh, saying, absolutely. 
Folks, we have a few more minutes uh, in the attendee uh, world. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, share. This has been a very enlightening uh, discussion. And Rachel, I, um, Rachel, could you? I know you're about to unmute there. I think. So. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I missed that, Rachel. <laughs> No, it's fine. I was really just going to say the panelists said what I was thinking, but they said it better. So I don't like listening to myself talk. So in fact, the, like, okay, whenever ahead. I edit videos, I listen to myself on two times speed. Um, and then if I hear myself talking at regular speed, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> It's funny yes. you mentioned that, you know, because quickly just, just to check, you know, one thing in the Zoom world now, we've made these recordings. We do have to make sure they work. I plop it in the middle. If it seems to work, I'm done. I don't, I never want to listen to myself. <laughs> we have a question from uh, the uh, audience. Uh, would you think there is a need, and if so, a way to embed embracing the mental health of graduate and undergraduate students, as well as faculty into the education system? I think it's difficult, but possible, I guess. So all of us are trained as engineers. We, we have PhDs, but we really learn nothing about education itself in graduate school. And we certainly don't have a background in psychology. Um, so I, I think it would be useful to have some type of training. Obviously, we're not going to become psychologists, but maybe just to become aware of cues from students if something isn't right, and then direct them to the appropriate sources for the help that they need. And I think, you know, just one thing to, to build on that, um, in, our, in my institution, we were actually, had just rolled out a workshop we went to uh, put together by our um, Center for Psychological Services for faculty to be able to um, recognize um, signs of student distress in the classroom. And then we switched to full remote. And then we had to redo everything to how do you address this over Zoom? So, you know, it was an interesting, um, and needless to say, you know, that was that was a heavy lift, but I think, you know, getting faculty aware of it was a good thing. Um, to add to that, you know, to, to, uh, back to the original question, I think one of the first things, honestly, is that we have to model that behavior itself. So for instance, I think an important thing is that if we demand, uh, if we want our students to have work-life balance, we need to model that as faculty. And I think one bad thing for Zoom that I, that I well, one good thing from going remote that I do want to model, um, I'll be honest, my work-life balance completely was off the kilter because literally my office was my home and vice versa. So the lines were blurred, but then, so we have to be, and I think a key word here besides inflection point, transfer function is deliberate. And I think that's a very important term. We had to be deliberate about the work-life balance. So if we want our students to have that and be deliberate about that, we also need to be deliberate about that as well. So it really doesn't answer the question so much, perhaps, as maybe the beginning, the first stab is that we need to model that. Yeah, I agree with that, Conrad. I was, I was going to say, you know, I mentioned earlier about having Zoom office hours in the evening. I'm very careful when I do that to be like, it's on this one day. And, and whenever the students are asking about it, I'm saying like, I'm setting aside this time that's normally like with my family, because I'm, I want to spend this time with you because I know you're free at this time. And I'm being, I'm very careful to make sure that those things, because I had the same issue of how these things are blurring. Um, but I think it's, it's about being transparent in that and saying, I value this time. I need to decompress. I need to refresh. I need to spend time with my family. And I'm going to come back refreshed to, to work with you guys tomorrow. But I'm going to do this one time with you because I know you need you guys are you need it right now, right? We we need to do this. I just think that transparency I think can help both ways. I know this is a structural thing, but again, as as one of the I guess administrative types on the on the panel um, who also teaches. Uh, one of the things that we've done in, in all of our teaching work, well, not all of our teaching workshops, in the early career um, workshops is we have a short segment um, that is sharing the link that I just shared with all of you saying, here's a list of possible signs of student distress in your classroom. And again, you can't always catch all of them, right? You're not going to get all of them. Um, and it's about patterns, right? You know, so if you see one day or two days or whatever, that may not be a problem. It's about patterns. And then the challenge to the faculty, and many of these are new faculty, is 
Where in your course are there opportunities where you might recognize some of these? And then they brainstorm and they crowdsource and they think about, well, in my course, you know, there's this exercise that I never realized it before, but it very often picks up on, you know, agitation and being disruptive and, you know, hyper, like it, this exercise brings that, it, it, it will allow me to see if that's actually happening underneath the surface. Um, and, and, and now that you've brought it up, up, I'm going to be a little more aware that when I, when I assign that exercise, they don't have to do anything different in their class. I now can say, this is an exercise that I know very often will reveal um, something, or this is something simple that I can do in class that will help reveal um, if there's an issue happening early. And I think that's, you know, again, the, the key is you don't want to be too early where it's not a pattern yet, but we've all as instructors been in the situation where we've noticed something too late. Um, so yeah, it, it's that, I, I love the question because it, it's easy to say, it's harder to actually put into action and know what it looks like when you're, when you're an instructor up in front of a class. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, folks. We're at 945. I don't, uh, I would love to continue this conversation until the, uh, time expires, whenever that might be. But I would like to thank everyone, all the magnificent uh, panelists uh, who joined us this morning. I'm very grateful. Uh, thanks to all the attendees, wonderful questions. And I hope to see everyone uh, either at ASWE, BMES, or uh, another venue. Conrad? Thank you guys very much. I did type in, remember your ungraded homework, returning it in for effort. But definitely do. I think this was a wonderful talk, um, wonderful panel. I'd like to thank each one of you sincerely. I do look forward to seeing each of you in person, wherever that may be. And Arush, I mean, Arush, that means you too, because I never see you and you're down the street from me. So exactly. <laughs> um, thank you guys very much. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. And actually,